this week on the Backtable Podcast. I think the big thing for people is that TCAR is somewhat of a new procedure. And so when I get a lot of referrals for patients, if they decide they want a TCAR, I'll get phone calls sometimes from the primary care or the cardiologist. They'll ask, why am I not doing it open? Especially yeah. if they can do transfemoral stenting themselves and say, well, I can do it endovascular. So I, I wanted you to do it open. And I think it's important to realize, well, transcarotid isn't technically purely an endo procedure. It's also not, yes, I understand it's not an open procedure, but the data for stenting is just as good as open so far from what we know. The beauty of this is you avoid some of the downsides of transfemoral, but maintain that positive aspect of endovascular in that it's minimally invasive, less risk of nerve injury, less scarring, and patients seem to do just as well. Welcome to the Backtable Podcast, your source for all things interventional and endovascular. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and on backtable.com. Now, a quick word from our sponsor. Physicians worldwide rely on peripheral catheters by Reflow Medical. And now, Reflow is introducing Cora catheters, a unique line of coronary catheters that are setting a new standard for complex PCI. The CoraFlex, CoraForce, and the CoraCross are all engineered with groundbreaking technology, and each device offers unmatched bilateral torque with the lowest overall profile available. For more information, visit www.reflowmedical.com. When your patient with peripheral arterial disease has narrow lesions or complex anatomy, Medtronic's Impact 018 drug-coated balloon should be part of your treatment algorithm. This low-profile DCB is 018 guidewire compatible. It also comes in two catheter lengths, 130 and 200 centimeters. The Impact DCB portfolio, which uses Impact Admiral, lets you choose your preferred treatment algorithm and minimize guidewire exchanges. Talk to your Medtronic representative about adding Impact 018 DCB to your treatment tools. Find more details, including risk and indications online at medtronic.com slash impact 018. Risks may include hemorrhage, embolic events, arterial perforation or rupture, amputation, or death. Now, back to the show. I'm your host, Dr. Ali Behetti, coming to you from Tacoma, Washington. Our topic today is carotid interventions. My guest today is my friend Ankur Agarwal, vascular surgeon in Indianapolis. Dr. Agarwal, welcome to the show. Hey, Purna, it's good to see you. It's been a while. I know. So um, a little bit of history. Ankur and I trained together. Uh, I was an interventional radiology resident and fellow. At the same time, he was a vascular surgery fellow at University of Virginia. And there's a lot of cross-pollination there. So uh, we scrub cases together. We share patients. And uh, it was a really collegial relationship there. And then after after we both left our training programs, we've kept in touch. Um, sometimes I'll hit him up for vascular surgery questions. He'll hit me up for IR questions. And it's been a, a really great resource to have somebody outside of my health system that can help answer things that I wanted to learn about for vascular surgery. Yeah, I think UVA was very unique in that way. Having such a strong vascular department, strong IR department, we would do EVARs together, which I know a lot of places don't do. You guys helped us manage a lot of the leg patients, especially when they came in with cold yeah. legs. You know, you guys did all the lytic catheters for us and right. really helped us out with some of the complex endovascular procedures that I knew nothing about, safaris and Dr. Wilkins kind of prepping on how to do drug eluting balloons and the best way to manage those patients. It was pretty crucial to the kind of things that I'm doing now. So it's too bad we don't get to see each other more often. I know. Yeah. You guys, you just got to move out to the Pacific Northwest. It's amazing out here. <laughs> I'm not moving to, the to Chicago Indianapolis, area. so that's on you. <laughs> well, Indianapolis isn't so bad. Come on. Everybody goes through here and drives through here and flies through here, so just stop on your way somewhere. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Getting to the topic for the day, can you tell me a little bit about what your practice looks like? Sure. So uh, I'm a vascular surgeon in Indianapolis. Uh, we have a group of currently four surgeons. We do a little bit of everything. We do open endovascular dialysis work. Um, so carotid is uh, a decent portion of my practice, both open and, uh, and endovascular. Uh, I'm just learning now how to do transfemoral stenting. It wasn't something mm. I did much in fellowship, but uh, I've done about 40 or 50 transcarotid arterial revascularizations, which is also a, kind of what we're going to talk about today is a hybrid of endovascular yeah. and open. And then I also do, of course, open carotid endorectomy. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, let's just jump right into it. How do these patients present to you usually? So we get a mix of symptomatic and asymptomatic patients. We get patients who either their primary care doctor 
heard a brewery and they sent it to us and we ordered the imaging for it or their primary care doctor may have ordered it as part of screening and they get sent to us if they have uh, a lesion of almost any kind, anything about 50% we see. And then we also see the symptomatic patients in the hospital as well, those that come in okay. with strokes. They get worked yeah. up by the neurologists and, and we see those patients. Okay. Do you mind walking me through kind of your basic algorithm for how you uh, stratify these patients? Sure. So I think about it as either asymptomatic or symptomatic because I think the algorithm changes a little bit based on that. Again, for the asymptomatic patients, I'm usually seeing them in my office. I get a carotid duplex on them and grade their severity based on that duplex. Um, The basic guidelines for duplex criteria are patients are rated as being 0 to 50% or less than 50%, 50 to 69%, and then greater than Mm -hmm. 70%. And the guidelines indicate that we try to intervene on patients when they're about 80%. So we use the duplex to keep following these patients. We follow them about every six months to a year, watch as they progress. And if they progress to the point of being 80% or greater, then we talk to them about intervention versus optimal medical management. And most of the time for 80%, most patients, just because they feel a little bit nervous about having this lesion, they usually would want to get it fixed once they reach that, that threshold. For symptomatic patients... We intervene usually anytime they're above 50% and they've had a, a stroke that we think is from okay. the carotid. We'll intervene on those patients. I see. Okay. And before they get to that 80% for the asymptomatic patients, what kind of medical management do you do for them? So we try to do optimal medical management, which is putting them on at least aspirin, if not aspirin or Plavix. It's usually just aspirin. Um, we try to make sure their blood pressure is controlled. If it's not, we get their primary care doctors involved, try to get their blood pressure controlled. If they're smoking, we talk to them about smoking cessation. We'll get their uh, cholesterol under control or send them to our cardiology colleagues to work on that. But as you know, doing peripheral disease, a lot of these patients, they may be quote unquote medically managed, but they don't stop their smoking. They don't always fix their diabetes. They don't fix their blood pressure. So optimal medical management is is really hard to achieve, but we try to at least do that up front and then Mm -hmm. watch if they progress while on optimal medical management. So uh, let's go to kind of down the asymptomatic pathway. So you've got somebody in your office, they have at least 80% stenosis. Could you walk me through the different options you have to intervene on these patients? Yeah, absolutely. So when I see them in the office, I first see if they are a good surgical candidate. Do they, I usually get a CAT scan once they reach 80% because that'll help me define the anatomy. Is the lesion uh, a high lesion or is it anatomically uh, good for an open carotid intervention. I ask them about their history, if they've had any interventions before, just to make sure it's not a restenotic lesion as opposed to a de novo lesion. Uh, make sure they haven't had any radiation in their neck or something that would make the neck a little bit more hostile. Uh, mm-hmm. Make sure they can tilt their neck, their neck up and down to facilitate doing the surgery. And I look at their age. I think age for me is a big criteria for whether I want to offer them an endovascular option or an open option. And I give patients both options, um, endovascular in terms of TCAR uh, versus open, because a lot of the data for TCAR is just as good as open. So I walk them through both surgeries. I walk them through what I think are the risks and benefits of both. And in younger okay. patients, I do steer them a little bit towards open, but I give them both options. Do you have like an age cutoff for young versus old in this patient population? So when TCAR first got approved, the uh, studies were all for 75 and older. For me, I try to keep it at about 70. So if they're younger than 70, again, I will offer them both. And I have done TCAR, I think so far in my career, once or twice on a patient who's younger than 70, because mm-hmm. they did, really didn't want the surgical scar. And the from a preference standpoint, that's what they wanted. But if they're younger than 70, I try to steer them a little bit more towards open intervention, because I think even though the data is still very good for carotid stenting, I do believe opens a little bit more durable. So I try to steer them in that direction. But I do give them both options. And if they really want the endovascular option, I'm okay with that because the data is pretty good for, for carotid stenting. Okay. So uh, let's break it down a little bit further. So you mentioned two options so far, or well, you really mentioned three, carotid stenting, that's from transfemoral approach, carotid stenting, TCAR, and then an open endorectomy. Could you just, uh, for an open endorectomy, can you walk me through the pros and cons of that procedure for a patient? Sure. So for open carotid endorectomy, it's an incision in the neck about four or five centimeters in length, sometimes a little bit bigger. The pros are it's been around for a long time. We've been doing carotid interventions from 1950s longer. It's very durable. There's very good long-term data for it in terms of mortality, 
um, very low stroke risk from the procedure. People shouldn't be doing it if they have a higher than 2% stroke risk. Most people have less than that when they're doing the procedure. And it works very well. And there's a pretty low resynodic rate when it comes to open carotid uh, interventions. The downside to it is they do get a, uh, an incision that's fairly decent size and in a visible place. So for some people, they don't want to have that incision. There's a much higher rate of nerve injury with open carotid enterectomy as opposed to endovascular. There's about four important nerves that we worry about in that area. And okay. there's a not insignificant risk of numbness to the area from the incision. The superficial nerves that supply that area, we just can't see them. They're too small. So when we make that incision, about 50% of people will get some neck numbness. And of mm -hmm. those 50%, I cite about another 50%, it'll go away, but the other 50% will have some permanent neck numbness. So almost as high as 25% will have some level of neck numbness in the area, which for some patients, that's not a big deal and they don't care about it. But for some people afterwards, it really irritates them and they don't like that sensation. Gotcha. And then these are always done uh, in the inpatient setting, correct? Like, or as a hospital outpatient. So you would, you'd have to do them in a hospital setting and you admit them overnight. And Correct. then how long do they usually stay in the hospital after the after an endorectomy? Most patients, they go home the next day. So it's usually an overnight stay. It, it does have to be done in the inpatient setting. Uh, we watch their blood pressure is the big uh, complication that can happen from open carotid endorectomy. So we watch it overnight and make sure their blood pressure is in the right range. If the blood pressure goes too high, you risk hyperperfusion syndrome, and that can lead to uh, a massive stroke and brain bleed. So oh, yeah. we watch them overnight. <laughs> keep their blood pressure under tight control and make sure it's where we want it to be before they go home. But the majority of patients will have their blood pressure in the right range and go home the next day. Okay. And then you mentioned durability of the procedure. So what do you do for a follow-up after a patient's gotten an endorectomy? So the SVS uh, came out with some guidelines back in 2011. They re-updated them in 2022. They recommend you, we see our patients uh, in my practice, we see them at two weeks just to check their incision, make sure they're healing mm. well. And then mm -hmm. the SVS guidelines recommend doing an ultrasound at one month to make sure the repair looks good, doing another ultrasound every six months for up to two years, and then every year annually. So we do that, one, to follow our repair, but then we also ultrasound the other side to make sure they haven't developed contralateral disease. Oh, sure. Patients, as yeah. you know, with peripheral vascular disease, if they have it in one leg, often they have it in another. Same thing can happen with carotid stenosis. If they develop it on one side, they're more prone to or more likely to develop it on the other side. So we ultrasound both sides make sure our repair looks durable, looks good, and make sure the other side hasn't developed any new stenosis. Okay. Yeah. Any other uh, pearls that you want to share with the audience about uh, carotid endorectomy before we move on to the endovascular options? I think it's just, it's a procedure that, I mean, I guess the pros are surgeons like doing it. It's one of those procedures <laughs> you ask any carotid sir or any uh, vascular surgeon, they, it's almost always labeled a, a favored procedure. It's a fun procedure mm. to do. You can, one other pro like, to the open surgery is you can put in a shunt during a procedure. So in some, patient, mm. in some patients who have contralateral disease or you clamp their carotid and they start to show signs that their brain's not receiving enough perfusion, either from cerebral oximetry or in some place like a UVA, for example, we were doing live EEG during the procedure. We can oh. see if their brain is still receiving enough perfusion and you can put in a shunt while you're doing your patch repair and your endorectomy to maintain that perfusion. That's not really an option for the endovascular approach. Um, when you're doing mm -hmm. transfemoral stenting, you don't need that because you're maintaining that perfusion the whole time. But with transcarotid revascularization, TCAR, you actually reverse the flow. So patients can, not often, but can show signs that they're not receiving enough blood flow during the procedure. I see. Okay. Well, I, I'd love to move on to TCAR. Uh, you've, you've talked a little bit about it so far, but for those who don't know anything about TCAR, maybe just walk me through from beginning to end what it is. Yeah, so TCAR is a fairly new technology that came out um, just about uh, a few years ago. The first studies uh, came out in twenty uh, in the early 2019, 2020 era about durability and feasibility mm -hmm. of it. So what it involves is it's still an open procedure, but it's, it's technically a hybrid procedure. We do a small incision at the base of the neck right above the clavicle and cut down on the common carotid low, put a purse string into the common carotid, and then utilize a sheath that goes into the common carotid stops a few centimeters before the bifurcation and it hooks up to a device that reverses flow out of the carotid and then goes into one of the femoral uh, veins. So you, it requires two mm. parts. One is the carotid cut down, but then also percutaneous access into the femoral vein. Uh, once you've put in your sheath, you reverse flow, take it out of that carotid into the femoral vein so that any 
plaque that might break off or any lesions that might happen when you're manipulating it actually get sucked out of the carotid through a filter and then back into the vein so you don't get any blood loss from that perspective and anything that breaks off should hopefully get brought through the filter and not go up to the brain. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. I get that. I get why that would be advantageous. So do do you do those procedures under GA2? So at my institution, I do do it under general. We're moving to slowly get it to be done under local sedation. When I trained at UVA, we did a little bit of a mix depending on the my attending's preference. Uh, one attending did all of his under uh, local and sedation, which is helpful mm-hmm. because during the procedure, it's the been shown to be the best way to monitor cerebral perfusion. You can have your patient have a little squeezy toy in one hand or uh, squeeze uh, an arterial line and you can basically see if their brain is receiving enough perfusion during the procedure, and that can alter what you do during the procedure. Open carotid, um, some people do also do it under local insedation, uh, but mm-hmm. it's a little bit more difficult uh, to do. Mm-hmm. It's a longer procedure, so patients have a little bit less tolerance for doing it under local sedation as opposed to a T-car. My average time is anywhere from 50 minutes to 70 minutes, so it's a little bit more well-tolerated with patients if uh if they need to be under sedation for just an hour as opposed to two hours with an open carotid. Okay, yeah. And you you kind of walked me through the procedure of how it it works, but what are some of the disadvantages of using a T-car approach? So it's still, uh, depending where you do it, it's still a general anesthetic. And I think the data is actually very good for T-car. It has a similar stroke risk in some series, maybe a little bit even less mortality, uh, not mortality, but uh, myocardial infarction risk than carotid. And so far... Really, the only downside to TCAR is that it's a stenting procedure, and mm. stenting data is extrapolated from the transfemoral data. So the transfemoral data, the reason we don't do transfemoral stenting more often is the stroke risk was almost double that of carotid and erectomy within the first 30 days. But there's long-term data, both from CREST um, trials as well as from the three-year data from the SAFFIRE trial. There's a lot of good trials out there that show that long-term stenting data, once you get past that initial 30 days is Mm -hmm. just as good with stenting as it was with carotid in terms of long-term stent prevention, restenosis risk, and things like that. So I think some people are a little bit wary when it comes to TCAR and doing it in younger individuals because while we do have long-term data, it's from transfemoral stenting data, and the longest date is about 10 years. So that's why TCAR was initially approved for 75 and older was because we knew at least 10-year data stenting data was good. We don't have 20, 30, 40 year data the way we have with open carotid endorectomy. I see. Yeah. I'm having trouble uh, identifying situations where you would do transfemoral stenting over a TCAR. Could you walk me through that? Sure. So TCAR, the beauty is there's not a ton of situations where you can't use it. Um, Transfemoral used to be the standard of care for uh, radiation in the neck or people you basically don't think can do well with an open operation. If it's a redo mm-hmm. operation, a uh, redo neck, a uh, radiated neck where the incision is not going to heal. With trans carotid revascularization with TCAR, even though it's still an open procedure, the incision being at the base of the neck, it you don't have as many anatomical reasons why you can't do it from a neck perspective, but mm-hmm. you do have strict anatomical criteria for patients that are allowed to get transcarotid revascularization. So you need to have a minimum runway in the common carotid for the sheath to be able to come in. So you need to have five centimeters from your cut down to the bifurcation for space for the sheath and the wire. Uh, You can't have circumferential or a lot of disease in the common carotid because then you're going to flick off a plaque or flick off a piece of something when you're putting your sheath in and your wires in before you have that cerebral protection. So there's certain anatomical criteria that differentiate when you can do transcarotid versus transfemoral, but the criteria are pretty good and pretty, uh, I think, lenient enough that it's rare that you would need to do a transfemoral stent as opposed to a transcarotid stent, I other see. than if you just don't know how to do it. Oh, yeah. So for for surgeons of your era, maybe, you know, trained 2015 post or 2016 post, was the TCAR procedure pretty commonly taught across vascular surgery residencies during that time? I think it was getting there. I think when I was there, there was only actually uh, at UVA, there was one surgeon that was doing it. And then when he left and we brought on another surgeon, that surgeon brought it with him from Mass General. So Mm -hmm. I think in my training, I only did about maybe 10 T-cars total. It's definitely becoming much more prominent now. If you go to any of the training courses, some of the surgeons that are there, 
are actually using TCAR. They're offering that to almost all their patients, regardless of age oh, or not. So okay. I think it's becoming much more prominent now, much more utilized now than when I first started training. I think that there's a huge shift because all of the recent trials and recent data that have come out in the past two to three years. That's great. Yeah. And is it a, is TCAR a proprietary thing? Like, is it or is that just a general term for when you reverse uh, the flow? Procedure the procedure itself is a general term, but there's only one company that has the product uh, that can okay. be used with TCAR. So it's a Silk Road product. Silk Road Medical is the company. And their uh, stent deployment system is called the En Route Stent Deployment mm. System. It uses a <laughs> uh, cordis stent that's put onto their proprietary device. And it's their proprietary filtration system that has the reversal system and the filter that filters the blood and then brings it back to the uh, to the vein. So in order to do TCAR, you have to go to either have done enough uh, TCARs during your training or go to the Silk Road Medical Training course, go through the hmm. course, get approved. And then you also have to have a certain number of procedures you do with a proctor before you're approved to do TCAR on, on your own. But one of the I advantages see. of TCAR, and there's actually been a couple of studies that have shown this, that as opposed to with carotid enterectomy, where there's clearly a learning curve with it, and same with transfemoral mm-hmm. scenting, there was a huge study where they had a lot of new surgeons doing TCAR, and they had the same complication rate as surgeons who are considered to be advanced users of the system or advanced uh, surgeons. So the okay. curve, the learning curve for TCAR has been shown to be much, much smaller than with other treatment modalities. Oh, that's really promising. That's great. One thing that, you know, working in the community like I do and like you do, sometimes we hear about awesome therapies that are done at at, uh, academic medical centers. (laughs) And I get worried about introducing stuff like that into the community and my population. But it's good to hear that there's not a huge learning curve for something like this. Okay, so the last procedure we haven't really talked that much about is transfemoral carotid stenting. I sourced Mike Barraza and Sabine Don for questions <laughs> about this, since I don't do this in my practice. But a um, couple questions from my co-hosts. Um, do you use proximal and dist- distal embolic protection when you do carotid stenting? So uh, I'm learning from one of the cardiologists at our pra- at our group. He's the mm-hmm. only person who's doing transfemoral stenting. Um, so based on the way he does it, we only use distal embolic protection. So that's, I think, one of the downsides to transfemoral stenting is that when you put your wire and catheters up into the carotid, you have to cross the lesion and then deploy your embolic protection device, all that without any kind of protection. So that's where mm. I think the strokes happen, where you're manipulating a wire in the aorta and then getting it up into the carotid. You have to get your filter across the lesion, deploy it, and that's when you're protected. And I'm sure that's when more of the strokes probably happen is getting your distal embolic protection in place and then gotcha. going about your procedure and then recapturing that filter and bringing it back through. I see. Okay. And then do you commonly do a post-stent angioplasty? So I don't. Um, again, this is just, I think, a, a little bit of a preference and from the way I was trained, but I pre-dill my lesions. So both with transcarotid mm-hmm. and with transfemoral, I pre-dill uh, the lesion, pre-dilate the lesion, and then deploy the stent. With The idea being with the stent that it's not meant to create this huge new lumen, though almost the way carotid endorectomy does. It's just meant to trap that lesion so that it doesn't okay. break off, or if it, a piece breaks off, it's trapped by the stent. So you don't need a huge lumen to have a successful repair. That being said, I will do a completion angiogram if it looks like there's a very severe tapering or the stent did not quite fully open the way that I want it to, and there's something that I'm concerned about. Then yes, I will pre uh, pre or post dilate. But I also get concerned about post-dilating that if I'm too vigorous with it, I might get a cheese grating effect, some of that plaque, because it is an open cell stent uh, design, even though as much as the company may say it's open cell, but a closed cell at the same time, because everything is so close, it is still an open cell stent. So if I'm Mm -hmm. too vigorous with post-dilating, some of that material can get through the stent and then embolize up. I see. Okay. And then could you just speak a little bit about sizing of these carotid stents um, and how it's different from stent sizing in other parts of the body, maybe? Sure. Yeah. So the rule of thumb is about one to two millimeters bigger than the size of the common carotid. And sometimes it looks huge. You put the stent in and it'll fit to the common carotid really well, but you'll get this very severe step off almost where the stent ends in the internal carotid and then the native internal carotid continues. You get this pretty drastic step off at times. Um, Mm -hmm. but you size it to the common carotid because you don't want the stent to be opposed to the wall in the internal carotid and then floating in the common carotid and not opposed to the wall. So you have to size it to the common carotid. 
There was some attempts to try to create tapered stents, but none of the data really panned out, I think, really well for that. So even though there's sometimes a step off, sometimes it looks a little weird in the internal where it's very, a, a big stent, you know, five, six millimeters, sometimes even bigger, eight, nine millimeter stent, and then you get a much smaller internal carotid. That's usually what we'll do. And the stent does a pretty good job over time of expanding and bringing the internal to be a little bit a little bit more tapered to the uh, to the wall of the normal internal carotid. But normal sizing for the stents that I use are almost always nine millimeter stents, occasionally eight if it's a really small common or a 10 if it's a really big one. But um, nine millimeters is sort of the normal uh, width of the stents that I use and then various lengths. Okay. And then let's talk about like, do you have bailout stents like you do in other parts of the body, covered stents if if you run into trouble or or. I, I have Extra. them available. I haven't had to use them. Uh, I have not had I a... hope you don't have a case this week where you have one. <laughs> I would feel really terrible. <laughs> no, I don't have any T-cars coming up, luckily. But uh, no, I, I mean, if, if there ever was a situation where there was a really bad dissection or uh, a bad problem, then we do have covered stents as a bailout. A lot of times we can, you can always cover the lesion and extend one way or down or up if you need to. Otherwise, the other bailout is actually just converting to open. I know that happened yeah. recently at one of our neighboring institutions. I heard the story where, you know, actually, I don't, I think the, it wasn't so much a bailout, but they couldn't actually get the stent to track into the internal. There was just a severe tortuosity. And even though they got the mm. wire in, they couldn't track mm. over the wire. So they actually converted to open and did it open at that time. Um, I think if it was me at that situation, if I needed to convert to open, if it was a choice where, this, I just couldn't get the stent to go where I wanted to. I would just bring the patient back and do it open. But if there was some emergency, some problem, the stent thrombose yeah. or some horrible complication, then I, that's the one advantage that I have that I can convert to open and put a clamp on there and fix it open if I need to. Ah, uh, yes. You have the fallback to open. And I am very <laughs> jealous that you always have that. <laughs> it's funny that's considered a fallback now. You know, you talk to most older surgeons, they probably yeah. would think it's heresy to think of open as being the fallback. But <laughs> patients... <laughs> I think patient preference is important. If they don't want an incision, yeah. if they want something minimally invasive, it's kind of the future of the way we're going. And peripheral vascular has proven that. So with the best CLI trial coming out and basal 2 coming out, there's clearly data that open does well, but endovascular does does pretty well as well. Yeah. One of my co-hosts wanted to know, do you ever intervene in the acute setting? I don't. We have great neuro uh, IR colleagues that do that. Um, so mm -hmm. if somebody comes in with an acute stroke, they've thrombosed their internal carotid um, or something else. Usually the neuro interventionalist will come in. They'll try and suck that clot out using all their incredibly complex catheters and wires that I can't even begin to fathom. But where we'll come in is if they manage to treat it, the acute problem, and then they see that mm -hmm. there's a, a critical lesion or critical stenosis, that's where we'll get involved. They'll The patient will come out of the suite. They'll get sent to our ICU. The neurologist will see them, and then they'll get us involved after they talk to the neurointerventionalist say, oh, you know, we found an 80% lesion or 90% or even less, mm -hmm. 50 60%, and this should probably be fixed by, by the vascular surgeons. That's where we'll usually be brought in to help take care of the patient. I see. And then how long do you usually have to um, medically manage or wash those patients before you can intervene on them? So we try to intervene anywhere between two days to two weeks. So we don't intervene right away because in that acute setting, depending how bad the stroke is, with the procedure, we have to heparinize them and you risk converting their ischemic stroke into a hemorrhagic stroke. So we will usually, once the neurologists uh, say it's okay, they'll be put on aspirin and Plavix, they'll be put on a statin. And once they think it's safe to heparinize, we'll either do the procedure two days after their stroke happened but before two weeks, because there is data that if you wait longer than two weeks, you risk a recurrent stroke happening um, oh. or recurrent problems. So we try to treat them within that time frame, far enough along that we're not going to give them a hemorrhagic stroke, but not too far along that we risk giving them another stroke. Okay. And I, I guessing that that same approach holds true if it's an acute carotid occlusion or if it's an acute occlusion on the setting of a chronic stenosis, right? Correct. Yeah. So if it really was just an acute occlusion that maybe came from AFib and they the neuro neurointerventionalist treated it, the clot was removed, and the carotid looked fine, we would just sort of follow them, make sure they don't develop new stenosis. But if it was acute on chronic, even if it came in the setting of AFib or something else, or they just thrombosed their carotid, once that was treated, we would try to treat their carotid lesion, the calcified portion that usually you can't suck out. We would try to treat that two days to two weeks. And depending on their age, how well they've recovered from their stroke and 
surgeon preference, it's either done open or with TCAR or, again, in that really rare instance where we're doing transfemoral stenting. Okay. Do you want to talk a little bit about the complication rates for each of these procedures? Did you prepare anything about sure. that? Yeah, I did. So um, overall, carotid stroke risk is a little less than 2%. And that's the guidelines. They say you should be following your data. And if you are having a higher rate of stroke than that, you probably shouldn't be doing open carotid enterectomy. The okay. data for transfemoral stenting, again, while the long-term data matched the carotid data in terms of both MI, stroke, and mortality, the short-term data, the within 30-day data, was double the stroke risk with transfemoral stenting. In almost all studies, hmm. it was about 4 to 5% stroke risk with transfemoral stenting. So that's why transfemoral stenting never really caught on, especially with the vascular surgeons, because if we have an open option that's better, that's probably what we should be doing. With TCAR, the TCAR stroke risk was, depending on which study you looked at, was as low as 0.6% uh, to up to 1.8%. So that's exactly in line with the carotid, open carotid data. It's no better, no worse. There was maybe a less, uh, a lower rate of MI with TCAR than with open carotid. Some of that is a little bit up for debate because the way they were checking MI is it's just based on troponin data and not necessarily symptomatic data or people who actually I got see. treated for an MI, which is similar to some of the data from the, from the CREST study. But in theory, there was a lower risk of MI with TCAR, but the same mortality rate, the same stroke risk, everything was similar to carotid interventions. The one advantage TCAR has is there's only really one nerve you have to worry about, which is the vagus nerve. So there was okay. definitely a lower risk of nerve injury with TCAR than with carotid uh, interventions. In the initial studies, I think there was only one patient that had a vagal nerve injury, and that patient recovered after six months. So there's definitely less risk from that perspective, and it's a, it's a smaller incision. You do have to stay overnight in the hospital, so you don't really get any benefit that way. Um, patients like outpatient procedures. Transfemoral stenting is still theoretically an outpatient procedure as long as they don't have a post-op complication, but for transcarotid, in order to get reimbursed, um, otherwise you'd be doing it for free, CME will only re CMS will only reimburse TCAR if they stay overnight. I see. Okay. Well, yeah. This is really useful. Um, this is not a procedure or an area of the body that I work on at all. I actually, I just uh, recently, my friend was reading an AJNR, something that referred to the rest of the body as the infracapital body. And I feel like <laughs> that's what I, that's what I do, infracapital IR. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's, it's nice to know that, uh, that there, all of these options are available. Is TCAR pretty much uh, only a vascular surgery procedure, like neurointerventionalists or cardiologists don't do it? It actually depends where you are. So where, when I got trained in TCAR at the Silk Road Medical Training Course, there were actually neurosurgeons there that were getting trained in it as well. And some of the neurosurgeons who were learning how to do it were actually having their neuro IR colleagues do it with them. So oh, they okay. would do the cut down procedure and then the neuro yeah. interventionalist would do the interventional portion of the procedure. So I think TCAR, a lot of it depends on where you are. If you are a vascular surgeon, yes, you can sort of do probably both parts on your own. But if you're a cardiologist that's getting trained how to do it, you probably will need some help with the cut-down portion, kind of similar to how cardiologists are doing TAVRs. Um, a sure. lot of the cardiologists work with cardiac surgeons or vascular surgeons for the cut-down portion of TAVRs. If you're a neurosurgeon that doesn't have any neurointerventional experience, you're probably going to use your neurointerventionalist to do TCAR with you. So I think a lot of it depends on where you are, which is why I think TCAR is a little bit unique in that there's definitely some collaboration that can happen. If you have surgical expertise, but no interventional experience, then you can get your interventional colleagues to do it with you or even vice versa. Yeah, for sure. Is there anything else that uh, you would want to let our audience know about uh, this set of procedures? I think it's. I think the big thing to for people is that TCAR is somewhat of a new procedure. And so when I get a lot of referrals for patients, if they decide they want a TCAR, you know, and I'll get phone calls sometimes from people the primary care or the cardiologist, they'll ask, why am I not doing it open? Especially yeah. if they can do transfemoral stenting themselves and say, well, I can do it endovascular. So I, I wanted you to do it open. And I think it's important to realize, well, transcarotid isn't technically purely an endo procedure. It's also not, yes, I understand it's not an open procedure, but the data for trans for stenting is just as good as open so far from what we know. The beauty of this is you avoid some of the downsides of transfemoral, but maintain that positive aspect of endovascular in that it's minimally invasive, less risk of nerve injury, less scarring, um, and patients seem to do just as well. So I think understanding that this is truly a hybrid procedure that takes the best of both worlds 
and it's it's essentially I th- in my mind I think of it as very similar to open carotid enterectomy. I again I do try to push maybe my younger patients, the 50, 60 year olds, to maybe think about the fact that we have 10 year data for stenting, but we don't have 20, 30 year data. So maybe an open yeah. procedure is the way to go. But even if a patient is in their 60s and they want a stent put in, uh, I don't really hesitate too much with that if if they feel strongly about it. That's awesome. Um, well, thanks for this overview, Ankar. I learned so much. And thanks so much for being on the show. Oh, well, I'm just trying to pay you back for all those phone calls. Uh, how do I do uh, dialysis catheters? <laughs> how do I do all these procedures that I never learned in fellowship? Oh, gosh. I'm, I'm always happy to help. <laughs> <laughs> well, all I right. appreciate it. Take care. Yep, you too. Thanks. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at at underscore Backtable on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable is produced and hosted by myself, Aaron Fritz, and co-hosts Chris Beck, Sabine Don, Michael Barraza, Jacob Fleming, and Ali Behetti. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon with support from Josh McWhorter, Aaron Bowles, Nick Shellcross, and Ness smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz. Article and transcript support by Taylor Robinson. And Delaney Aguilar. Social media and PR by Anne Dang. Administrative support provided by Jim Lee Kinnebrew. Intro and extra music is Ripperoo by Skeptic Moon. Find us on Spotify or at local live music venues in New Orleans, Louisiana. Thanks again for listening. 